a very warm welcome to this special event. I'm Martin Herrmann, co-founder and chair of Klug, the German Climate and Health Alliance, and I will be the moderator for today. We are here to jointly explore the concept of social tipping interventions for stabilizing Earth's climate, for securing habitability of our wonderful planet, for securing human and planetary health by staying within planetary boundaries. This event will be a start. We will have more events on social tipping in the future. And in February, we will also have two social tipping intervention labs. Habitability of our planet and only home is at stake. This already leads today to a planetary health emergency. So everything is at stake. We are here to find ways to act that start resolving the paralysis that humanity is in. This means acting at the edge of what is possible. Most of us here are health professionals and I believe that mobilizing health professionals, acting jointly as health professionals, communicating health narratives, taking leadership where required, can be a game changer, can trigger social tipping dynamics. We invite you to step back with us to deeper understand the emerging paradigm of social tipping interventions to get inspiration and powerful perspectives for the transformational projects you are working on or you might initiate. We are very happy that we have three speakers today who have been starting this new paradigm of social tipping interventions, each of them in their own way. Ilona Otto has been the first author of the highly influential article on social tipping dynamics for stabilizing Earth's climate by 2050. Tim Landon has been the first author of tipping elements in the Earth's climate systems in 2008. He has published many other influential papers and books and has moved his focus in the last years on the social tipping perspective. Nick Watts is leading the sustainability unit of the NHS and is responsible for delivering the first net zero emission health service. Yet he's waiting for others, for us to compete with him who will be the first zero emission health service in the world. He knows that it only can be done when others are following and competing and cooperating. With Ilona and Nick, we have been cooperating closely for many years. This cooperation has very much influenced our work. Tim, for you, it is the first time joining us, but I sense many conversations will follow. I invited speakers to have conversations at the edge, being aware that they are speaking to change agents, that you are dedicated to act at the edge, to cooperate at the edge and to find powerful ways powerful ways to address the multiple crises we are in. We will have very brief intros to the concept of tipping dynamics in the earth system and to social tipping from Tim and Ilona, followed by 10 minute presentations from each of the speakers. Then we will discuss in the panel and then we'll take some questions. We invite you to put your questions into the Q&A tool and we'll use some of them for the discussion at the end. So Tim, the floor is yours for a short intro into tipping dynamics in the Earth system. Oh, thank you, Martin. Uh, good to be here. Yeah, so why don't I start by just sharing a little uh, toy model, I would call it, of a system I'm slowly forcing up to and past the tipping point. But like many complex systems, uh, there's a, there are alternative stable states. So I guess for the human, that could be life and death is the most profound alternative states of the organism. Um, and as we all know, as we 
age we become less resilient and at some point some small ish or perhaps large perturbation will be enough unfortunately to uh, cause that tipping point to death and at some point death becomes inevitable um, but that toy model of alternative states where we're forcing one to lose stability and then we tip into another well that can be applied to all kinds of complex systems including bits of the climate system but as we're here to talk about um, transformations in social systems as well so just to introduce the use of this concept in the climate system um, we basically set out about 15 years ago to identify what in a medical metaphor you might think of as the main organs of the climate system that could be tipped into an alternative state um, but we called them the tipping elements in the climate system um, and this is our one part of our updated list or map of tipping elements so these are all systems that have alternative stable states can be tipped from one to the other by human activities global warming this century um, I won't go through what these all are, but some will be familiar to you, maybe others less so. The ones on this map, if you tip these organs to, to, to another state, well, the whole organism, the whole climate knows about it. That's why they're called global core tipping elements. There are some other, we call them regional impact tipping elements, where maybe you can take these organs out and maybe it doesn't disrupt the whole organism, but my word, hundreds of millions of people would know about it. For example, the, the irreversible loss of tropical coral reefs would affect the livelihoods of half a billion people. Um, we spend a lot of time, as maybe I'm a planetary health professional, I don't know, but as a Earth system scientist, as we call ourselves, trying to work out at what global warming level on the y-axis these different um, tipping elements or organs of the climate would would be tipped into another state and the uh, sobering take-home message from that is well four of them four or four organs are already in danger at the current level of warming and at the one and a half degrees C level of global warming um, four of them might become likely and as things get warmer above that it just gets worse the risk level goes up which probably intuitively obvious that it would um, but we're talking about major risks here like we commit the loss of the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets eventually that would lead to over 10 meters of global sea level rise and um, the last thing to say by way of introduction is of course, just like the body, the elements or organs of the climate system are not independent. And if you if you tip one of them, it has effects on the others. In fact, I'm afraid it tends to be that tipping one thing makes tipping another more likely, which kind of fits the medical metaphor, I think. I won't take the time to walk you through the kind of mechanisms by which tipping one thing makes tipping another more likely in this in this diagram but suffice to say you can kind of see that the the causal interactions spread perhaps from a regional beginning in the arctic but through a great big connector the atlantic ocean circulation to the southern hemisphere and throughout the planet all right that, i think i don't know if that was five minutes but that's that's probably enough to give you just a little sense of uh tipping points in the climate system and why they're perhaps the biggest concern as a source of dangerous climate change. Thank, thank you very much. And, and for all who want to go deeper, I mean, there are fantastic videos from you where you're explaining it much longer in uh, on YouTube. So I think it is available and also we can point to it. And also reading your articles, it's all kind of fleshed out. So Ilona, uh, over to you to give us a short introduction into social tipping dynamics or social tipping interventions. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, and yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's great to be here. And uh, I prepared a few slides, but uh, I need to say that uh, my research was uh, inspired by Tim Tim's research. Exactly. So just as uh, uh, Tim showed the, the, the movie that show um, kind of illustrated how to understand the um the, the tipping dynamic uh the dynamics in any system in the same um way you you can think about social systems here yeah, that you can uh, well we, we know it yeah that we observe sometimes um, rapid changes and uh, 
also changes that that really kind of change everything. So just like uh, Corona pandemics or now the, the, the war in Ukraine, like suddenly everything um, is changing and everything is, is different. Yeah. So in the same way, we can think about the social system, right? that there are some um, critical uh, parts that uh, influence the dynamics of the whole system. Um, and kind of following um, uh, um, the definition of, of tipping elements that um, actually Tim, uh, Tim and his uh, co-authors proposed in um, one of my papers, we tried to use this logic to um, ask the, the or, or to ask the question, uh, what are the, the tipping elements in the in the social system that are important for um, yeah for stabilizing the earth uh, climate and getting to the um, net uh, zero system um, um, and uh, we we run like a, a longer process uh, with expert uh, um, interviews and so on and this was the result yeah that we differentiated those uh, six uh, kind of very important systems that have uh, play a role for the uh, uh, for the dynamics of the whole uh, world earth system and they include um, the energy and production and storage system human settlements financial markets information feedbacks uh, norms and value system and education system i will not go into the details but maybe just to say, to, to to tell you that those uh, um those uh, um, yeah, those, those those candidates for typical elements they operate at different uh, levels of social structure and also different time scales. Yeah, so some take longer to tip, some can tip uh, um, quicker, um, and maybe no, not everything is there. So this paper was published uh, two years ago, and uh, by now, so this is like outcome of our conversations. Yeah, that we had that probably also you can think about the health system as such. A candidate for for a tipping element yeah because if you start talking about uh, or even thinking about climate change in terms of human health and and what it means actually it it yeah it, it it's the, uh, the the highest priority yeah like everyone cares about uh, health um, and maybe you know bringing uh, this conversation about climate mitigation at this you know public health human health level maybe it's it's a, it's a game changer so I'm, I'm looking forward to your feedback um Kind of uh, what are the recent developments? Yes. So in my recent research, I, I um, try to kind of understand uh, kind of where we are, where are we heading. So in this figure, you see the historic uh, CO two emissions, and and the future projections, and the net zero pathway. It's on this uh, blue curve. So we need to get there. And as you see, we are not really there yet. We are kind of more on, on this um, um, uh, curve of uh, uh, business as usual. That means global warming of around four degrees at the end of the century. And the question is actually how to bend this curve, how to get uh, on this on this uh, net zero um, um, kind of Paris uh, uh, pathway that uh, that uh, is here shown with this blue curve. Uh, in my work, we look at uh, first what kind of behavior and lifestyle changes are needed to get there. Also, at inequalities. Um, what it means, also what kind of infrastructure changes uh, are needed, and finally, um, in most recent work, we also look, look at uh, land use and um, kind of what needs to change uh, in the land use to 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 enable the transition to net zero. And as you see, it's uh, yeah quite pessimistic. So like the COVID um, pandemic brought this this decline in the emissions, but just now we are on the rise again. Yeah, and. Uh, um, yeah, and maybe it does not look so positive, but at the same time, um, I, I'm working also um, uh, back on the ground, like we're really we're, we're some you know, case studies of, of the transition and case studies of some uh, communities that uh, um, that um, kind of radically change the way how they produce the air, their energy. Uh, and there are many promising examples, yes. Yeah? So I think uh, maybe we just need to uh, scale them up and uh, ask a question exactly what is needed to, 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 to speed up and scale up those, those changes. I think I probably run out of uh, my time, so I will finish uh, here and uh, yeah, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Ilona. And uh, I will hand back to Tim to uh, kind of present. He has now his 10 minutes slot to more discuss or, or present kind of how his uh, understanding of uh, social tipping points has emerged. When uh, was the time when you were moving over and also what is your current focus in this uh, study? In one of your uh, uh, video talks, I have been uh, 
listening to you, how you were saying that in a way you are almost a bit tired to only work on the uh, earth system tipping points and, and, and handing over uh, negative messages because you really feel that it is much more important to also see how we can get into action and how we can even imagine that real fast changes could be possible, that social tipping actually is an option and how we can trigger that and work on it. So in a way you have shifted your focus at least to some extent. So over to you, Tim. Yeah, thanks, Martin. I, I have shifted my focus um, because I think we all need to feel some agency in the face of complexity and in the face of a seemingly daunting and enormous challenge like climate change. But actually, the social tipping understanding helps give us back some empowerment that um, despite our small scale, we can be part of pretty transformative change. Um, so I kind of grew up thinking like this because my great great aunt pictured here, Lillian Lenton, well, you might be able to notice from the number on her jacket that she's in prison. This is 1913, this photograph was taken. She was in prison because she was one of the famous suffragettes and she'd been uh, imprisoned for being suspected to be part of burning down the tea house in Kew Gardens at the time. But like many suffragettes, she was uh, on hunger strike in prison. Uh, it gets worse, I'm afraid, because she got uh, force fed. I did most of the suffragettes on hunger strike that they put the tube down the wrong way into her lungs. I don't need to tell you as a medical audience what that does to you. She survived being effectively drowned. Um, but the government then covered up what had happened and argued she was only in hospital because of her hunger strike. And it became obvious pretty quickly that was a lie. That was one of many events that turned public opinion against the then government and in favor of folks for women in the UK. Um, so for me, growing up with that family history, social tipping is like um, part of what makes us who we are and 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 we were proud to have a relative who was part of that and of course um well we've just seen social tipping with the climate movement or movements and it's got well-known tipping dynamics reinforcing feedback basically by protesting school skipping school on a Friday and protesting outside the Swedish parliament, Greta Thunberg makes it incrementally easier for the next person to join her protest and skip school, and it makes it incrementally easier for the next person, and so on and so on. And that was such a strong reinforcing feedback that it snowballed pretty quickly into mass protests of millions of people. Um, and that that those dynamics, those tipping dynamics, they've been known about for at least 40 years and described by academics. They, in this case, they led pretty quickly to government declarations of climate emergency situation, including here the European Parliament's declaration in November 2019. But uh, as Greta would remind us, there's absolutely no point or power in a declaring an emergency unless you act with urgency and response and act on the things that actually make a difference to the climate, which are the greenhouse gas emissions. So it's pretty obvious to me also that um, that involves changing not just society, but technology and our relationship with it, but also that we've changed technology really quickly at times in the past. Uh, not necessarily in a good direction in the past, but this is one of the famous examples. That's Easter Parade in Fifth Avenue in New York City in the year 1900. Everybody's in a horse-drawn carriage except for one person in an automobile there in the middle of the shot, if you can see my pointer. Um, 13 years later, the same Easter Parade, New York City, everyone's in an automobile, one person's left in a horse-drawn carriage. They're actually in roughly the same part of the street over there in the middle. That's a transition in personal transport that unfolded within that decade across US cities and of course spread around the world. So that's just one of a zillion examples that we sometimes change technology really quickly. Uh, that, that transition landed us with the internal combustion engine, but the electric vehicle is now, I really think, um, at a tipping point in many major economies. And the first one to go as it were, it was Norway. And again, that traces back to social activists, actually. It traces back to 
members of the pop band AHA, for the older members of the audience will recognise Morton Harkett, also an environmentalist, Frederick Haug here, and a, an architecture professor in Stavanger, Harold Rosbeck in the middle. Uh, they imported this hobby converted Fiat Panda electric vehicle to Norway with a bunch of demands on the then Norwegian government of Groharl and Brundtland, um, asking for the registration import tax to be waived for electric vehicles, asking for road tolls to be waived for electric vehicles and a bunch of other demands. And because they're a, a pop band, some of them, the media were shining a light on this story and could effectively join them in shaming the Norwegian government into some sort of action. Um, it took a while to get their demands listened to, but it created they were listened to eventually, and it created enabling conditions for a major tipping point to uptake of electric vehicles in Norway. Uh, an advantageous choice in a country with 97% uh, hydroelectricity that's pretty cheap anyway. But yeah, in the last 10 years, this graph just shows you that um, battery electric vehicles have gone from sort of no, no market share to, well, in 2020, it was uh, over 50% and it's now at around 90% market share. Um, another interesting recent example of a tipping point from where I'm from, the UK, is also just in the last 10 years, we shut coal burning out of power generation um, it was 40% of power generation in 2012, the black peak on the graph in 2012, and it's dropped precipitously since. Uh, in this case, the key agents were the government policymakers or the civil servants choosing to spend public money on lots of incentives to grow renewable capacity, the green, the blue, the yellow wedges, but also at some point just putting a small price, a modest price on um, carbon emissions specifically in the power sector and in, in addition to the EU um, traded carbon price at the time, recalling that we were still in the EU back then. Um, but just a small price on carbon um, tipped coal to be less profitable um, than gas burning. And then all the investors who were invested in coal took their money out of coal burning because they weren't making any and they were and so that's just summarized by a quote here from a utility analyst at the time in 2016. And then this triggered irreversible consequences because the utility companies who maintained the power stations that were costing money to sit idle uh, realized that, that they were a no-go. And then they started destroying the coal power stations. This one is Didcot in Oxfordshire. So then you're in an irreversible tipping point and there's no way the UK is going back to burning coal and good riddance to it. So I've been, you know, busy trying to find these empirical examples of tipping points that are actually happening in social ones, but also we're all interested in the ones that could happen and that would need to happen to uh, have any hope of limiting global warming anywhere near one and a half degrees C and limiting the risk of the bad climate tipping points. So as you're a more medical audience, I always think, it, it's interesting to, to, to ponder on whether there could be a dietary change tipping point. Uh, it could take several forms, but uh, you'll all know that um, eating less red meat in particular is good for lots of health indicators. Um, you know, so diabetes, diabetes, cancer risk, coronary mortality. Uh, also, eating less red meat is radically better for the climate and better for land use and biodiversity so it's a sort of win-win doesn't mean we're going to eat less red meat but interestingly we're living in a time where there are both extraordinary signals of increasing um, interest in vegetarianism and vegan diets but at the same time there are technological substitutes for meat eating so there are plant-based alternative proteins there are sort of fermented microproteins and there will be lab cultured meat as well coming to market at competitive price and taste very soon. So there are quite a lot of possible reasons to think there might be a tipping point um, away from current sort of trends of uh, uh, increasing meat eating. 
And that will certainly have some huge benefits if it were to happen. So my overall sort of way of thinking is, well, this is a more empowering space to be talking about. We can all do something about climate change if we accept the logic of positive tipping points, because we're all consumers of some in some kind, whether it's food or cars or whatever. Um, and we're not actually having to put our lives on the line here like my great great aunt Lillian did. So we've got agency to change the world for the better without um, quite as much personal jeopardy. Um, but we don't want to do it just on our own. The most effective change comes from a kind of coalition of us, society, often with uh, business change, with some capital, some finance shifting behind it, hopefully with some good policy helping steer things, and probably with the media helping kind of tell and amplify good news stories. And that this is just a little sketch of the kind of framework that's a work in progress um, that many of us are involved in that tries to map out okay what are the what are the three steps to creating positive tipping points we've got to do some work to create enabling conditions we might want to do some sensing of how close we are to tipping to know when it's most powerful to act and then we've got to get on and do it um, so yeah that's enough from me I think on where my thinking is on social tipping points Suffice to say, if we don't take this path, what are we left with? We're left with something like the mon monks in this his historical monastery who uh, who are basically regulated in a in a fairly um, blunt way um, their eating habits in this case, because that there is the door to the refectory in the monastery. Um, so they just made the door narrow enough that if you were too fat, you couldn't get through the door to eat any more. I hope we don't have to go into that future where we need such punitive measures to control our own overconsumption. But the only other option now is, is we take the positive tipping point path. Tim, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now I hand over to uh, Nick. Uh, we call this event theory and practice. And it is clear for me, um, Nick, you have moved over to be a full practitioner of Get Things Going. And uh, I just want to introduce you by what Christiane told me. She's a journalist who interviewed you in London. And she said, and she knows many, 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 many people, many influential people, and she's interviewed many people. You were one of the one or two kind of who she felt is the strongest with a strategic sense for what needs to happen. And then moving into action to get it going. So uh, from that, I'm inviting you to talk uh, about what you are observing about kind of some nonlinear dynamics that it will take about social tipping. What is a, your latest kind of report back from your practicing the work, perhaps even from today? So Nick, uh, you have the stage. Of course, of course. Thank you, Martin. Mate, it's always such uh, a pleasure. Genuinely, I think these, um, these events you guys run are probably some of the best that I get to go to every every year. Um, oh, listen, I'm not as erudite or as uh, clever or intellectual as um, as the other speakers. I'm so sorry I don't have clever theories, um, but I do have some stuff that we've messed up along the way uh, in the NHS and uh, some lessons I think that we've learned. Hey, um, let me put this in context. The NHS is big. How big? 1.4 million healthcare professionals, the fifth largest organization in the entire world. The only other things that are about as big as us are either the Chinese army, the American army, uh, Indian rail company, Walmart. Um, we have the emissions profile roughly the same size as the entire country of Croatia or Denmark. Our annual spend is about 155, 160 billion pounds every year. The NHS is, is big, right? We've got our own net zero targets, net zero by 2040 for the emissions we control directly, 2045 for our full profile, and we're damn angrily, grumpily serious about them. We're not offsetting any more than 6% for our direct profile and 8% for our indirect profile, and we're taking account of everything. So when you think about the challenge we face, well, it's a pretty interesting challenge and in how you might tackle that, because you don't get with climate change to just do two or three things and then go, job done, that was fun. Good on you. 
You have to tackle everything. You have to tackle every single possible source of emissions you can dream of, not just five drugs in the British National Formulary, every single drug, all 182,000 of them, not just a few specialties, but every specialty from the concrete in the hospitals that we're in to the roving internal combustion engines that we call ambulances. We have to tackle all of that. So how do we think about that? Well, a few different ways, right? Number one, you get the bearded bureaucrats somewhere in London to deal with some of the big political shifts, right? Uh, and there we fight big, big political fights, mostly with cabinet office, mostly with treasury, either trying to change our procurement legislation um, or trying to ensure that we have the financial resources that we need. And, you know, broadly, we're doing okay. We've invested about 877 million pounds over the last two years into healthcare decarbonization. It's gone a damn long way. Is it enough? No, it's about 70% of our total requirement, which is pretty damn good, frankly, for something the size of the NHS. We think our total requirement is about 7.7 .7 billion pounds over 10 years. But I think I would put to you, Martin, and I think you'd agree, mate, um, that the barriers we face are not really financial, not at their heart, right? There's money there. It's just often in the wrong place. But there's money there if you can make the case for it. They're not financial. They're frankly not technological. Before we started, there was no such thing as a zero emission ambulance, a zero emission operation, a zero emission uh, delivery now, two, three years on, all three of those things exist. The NHS can innovate. We can innovate and we can answer those questions. In fact, the problem I think we face, not technological, not financial, is social, is how do you take the biggest resource the NHS has, our 1.4 million staff, and put them to work? How do you get them excited about this stuff? Three things I think matter. Autonomy matters. People have to feel as though it is their damn mission and they are in charge. When you give a nurse the ability to take control of the future of healthcare and medicine, I promise you they will grab it with both hands, kick you in the shin, and then run away with it. So we've tried to do a fair bit of that. We've built it into the beating heart of the NHS, into the Health and Care Act of 2022. We don't ask nicely anymore. If you want to be a NHS trust, you better damn have your own net zero strategy, your own board level lead, and your own clinical lead, and your own resources to tackle that every single trust in the country now. It also matters that we do that in slightly less angry, gov less governancey ways. So we build it into job descriptions out across the country. Not every job description yet, because we're a big confederated system, but about 28% of all healthcare professionals in the country now, hundreds of thousands of us have it built into our job description that a good healthcare professional tackles climate change. The autonomy matters, the capability and the capacity matters. I talked a little bit about the financial capability capacity there, but it also matters that we are giving people the opportunity to have a go at this and mess it up, right? Give you an example of that. We have a pretty firm commitment uh, that we have managed the politics of and fought cabinet office of. Within the decade, the NHS will no longer purchase from anyone that does not meet or exceed our commitments on net zero. That's big and it's bold, but when you think about how you have to operationalize that, well, we are big and bold. We're 82,000 suppliers that we purchase from across the entire world, huge, our supply chain. Who actually controls that? Well, again, it's not actually a bearded bureaucrat somewhere in London. It is the nurses up and down the country deciding what asthma medication they prescribe. It is our... Uh, catering staff deciding what uh, we give to our patients and what we give to our staff. It is our 11,000 procurement officers. Those are the people that are making those decisions on where the NHS spends its money every single day. So our job is to provide them with the guide rails to say, listen, you guys are empowered. Go forth and mess it up. Go forth and have a go. And so we've seen uh, April 1st, 2022, we put in new regulation, 10% weighting into every single tender that the NHS uh, approves has to go towards net zero. That builds over the next couple of years and it gets to the point where we say we, we now no longer want to purchase from anyone that isn't there. But I just want to explain the theory of change of what's going on there. We are not ready for that 2027 moment, right? And we're not ready, frankly, because our staff are not carbon literate enough. Equally, a 10% weighting is not going to change a single procurement point anywhere. What it is going to do 
is force a conversation that previously was never ha happening with every single one of those physiotherapists, with every single one of those asthma nurses, and with every single one of our 11,000 procurement officers and our 82,000 suppliers about what the hell a low carbon version of that product looks like. It's about creating the capacity and the space and the time to upskill our workforce. That as well as the carbon literacy training profiles that we've started to put in place, as well as the e-learning that we've made mandatory, as well as the board level training. So the autonomy matters, the capability, the capacity matters, and one more thing matters. And I think this matters the most out of everything, fun. Fun matters. This stuff is only going to work. It's tough. It's really hard work. It's damn exhausting. I've burnt myself out more times than I care to admit. This stuff only really works if we are all having fun, not if we're beating each other over the back of the head with a stick. It only works if we're feeling good about the transition that we are driving towards. And so we've had to remember that at every stage, we don't do a huge amount of particularly angry performance management. If someone's not doing well, if a trust is not quite there, we go and figure out why and we pair them with our best performing trust and we provide them with extra resources, not less resources. Best iteration, the best example I've got of the importance of fun. It's been a busy couple of years for the NHS. 2020 was a busy year. 2021 was a busy year. 2022 was a busy year. In fact, quite busy for healthcare systems everywhere in the world. We had a micro grant scheme. We had 5,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds. If you were a nurse or a doctor or a pharmacist out in community and you had a cool idea, we didn't care what it was. It had to tackle climate change. It had to directly improve the healthier patients and you had to have fun. We had a little bit of funding for you if you had an idea. We put this out and we were pretty worried because frankly, if you read the Telegraph and the Daily Mail, you could be forgiven for saying, for thinking that nurses might turn around and say, what, you want me to do that on top of everything else I've had to do? Absolutely not. We'd forgotten that 91% of our staff angrily care about climate change. We've forgotten about that nurse I told you about that'll kick you in the shin if you give them the opportunity to take control of their profession. We thought that success would be 50, 60 applications maybe, and then we would replicate it next year and maybe we'd double it to maybe 150 applications. We had to close it early because we had 17,000 applications from 17,000 angry, passionate, excited healthcare professionals who wanted to take this forward, who were just excited to have a little bit of fun. I'll stop there, Martin, but I think my core premise is that the barriers are not often where we think they are. They are not, I don't think, in the finance. If you can make the argument compelling, compellingly, that finance, that capital is frankly available and not as big as you might think it is. The innovation, frankly, is something that if the NHS can do, believe me, everyone else can get its act together. Um, it is a social question. It's a question of whether or not we can unlock our biggest resource. And for us, we think, autonomy, capability, and capacity, and a heck of a lot of fun. Nick, thank you very much. Again, fantastic uh, presentation, because it's also clear, it's a lot of fun, but it's also a lot of passion. And it's taking a stance that we're going to do this. Why? Because we will do this. Yeah. Full stop. Yeah. And then staying with all the, you know, the details that is required, the, the accounting of all the, all the details, understanding the magnitude, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and just staying with it. And through that, changing the platform from where people can align to or can work with, and, and then the fun and the, the relationships that you, you know, I, I know you quite well by now, you relate to people. And uh, it's always kind of on the same level. And yes, we have hierarchy, but we can only do it as buddies and not through hierarchy alone. So I think that uh, you are embodying this and that's very important. And I would not agree with you that you are not a very thoughtful and also a person who is very influenced by theory. I mean, for a long time, you were executive director of the Lancet Countdown, it's a huge science, scientific work, yeah. but it's uh, fantastic that you moved over and thank you very much for the example. So Ilona, I hand over to you. Uh, you kind of, so introducing the article two and a half years ago, uh, this is also a wave of feedback coming back, much more uh, uh, kind of reactions you got than you were expecting. And you see the example now uh, of Nick, kind of what he's doing there. 
So what are your comments? What are the things you are working on? What are the questions you, that uh, keep you busy at night? Yeah, so, so thanks, yeah, thanks uh, Nick for those uh, very powerful uh, examples. Great to hear, yeah, because like uh, maybe if you, you know if you work in science at this global level and you deal with uh, kind of like more aggregated data, it's it's easy to 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 lose the hope. But again, if you hear those kind of reports from from the ground, what's happening, and the same for me, like uh, when I uh, travel so, to some research site, like I I, I talk to um, to people from from different sectors, then you you really see that this is happening, yeah, this is happening. But still, you know, on on this kind of aggregated level. It's uh, sometimes difficult uh, to 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 see it in, in the data. Yeah. So, but so I think we need to to hear more. Um, um, yeah. Um, testimonies like this and, and and share those stories. Yeah. And and kind of empower and compare what what works, what what not. Yeah. I noted some uh, some some keywords. I think like. Uh, um, you know the leadership, for instance. You know that that there's someone like you who who you know who who makes those things possible and maybe you know pushes something and I think this is extremely important um to 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 have leadership and then um so so uh, maybe not on their hand like I, I do a lot of research on on inequalities also emission inequalities and there are really huge differences yeah if you uh, at first if you look at um, um lifestyle emission yeah it, it's actually like a very small portion uh, of people who cause the majority of emissions like in every um, aspect, like transportation and you know, housing emissions, um, also consumption, except food. Yes, yeah? so if you look at, at food, we all have about the same emissions uh, from, from food. Like if you look uh, across all you know, different social groups, but otherwise like there are those, those huge differences. Yeah, and also kind of like the, the question that I'm asking myself, that it seems like what you also said, like the people kind of you no know, regular uh, people, like you know, the nurses you, you said, it's, it, they care, yeah, they want the change, yeah, but it seems sometimes that those people on the top, um, sometimes like you, you have like a mayor or a company a director, you know, whoever that that they don't want the change, yeah, because they are afraid of the change. I mean, they want to don't they don't want to lose their positions, and they are kind of blocking this change. So so maybe like as I'm listening to you, like it's extremely important to. Uh, maybe sometimes to 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 you know to bring those those to change the leadership yeah and bring people uh, who are you know more open and uh, maybe also have you no know, kind of more diversity because I have to admit that many kind of people at those kind of you know important positions are older men yeah and and you know, nothing against older men but maybe you know there I don't know maybe it's for them more difficult to take risky decisions. Um, and um, um, I don't know. Maybe they 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 think um, kind of more um, I don't know a bit differently than um, and if you if you had you know like more you know younger people more more diversity. Um, and what else? I think the yeah, emotions that you mentioned, you know, this feeling of of, of fun is, is is extremely important. So um, um, yeah, this is also what what kind of uh, we we uh, I notice in my research exactly like kind of you need. Um, either uh, enthusiasm, emotion, or anger, you know, to, to motivate people to, to change. So this is extremely important. Um, and of course, anger is, is, is maybe a bit dangerous. So, so maybe enthusiasm, fun, it's, it's, it's uh, much uh, better. Um, maybe like one um, keyword that I'm kind of coming across, it's like uh, monitoring and greenwashing. So, so it's great to hear those examples, but you also hear like a lot of... Um, um, advertisement, yeah, that uh, you have like lots of products and, and companies arguing that they are producing those uh, carbon neutral products, and maybe it could be the same, yeah, like that this question, like, if, how, you know, what does it mean like uh, to be climate uh, neutral, like for a healthcare unit or like for a company, uh, what does it actually mean, how to, how to calculate that, you know, and um, how to, um, um, you know, offset, or, or what you can offset, what not, you know, and how. Um, so I think maybe there is like a, a need to to have some 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 stronger tool and avoid greenwashing because there's a danger that you know that um, you know many uh, companies see that there is some potential and and then um, you know they promote products that are not necessarily um, green and and climate neutral. Um, what else? Like uh, maybe kind of reflecting a bit on the technology. Yes, so I, I fully agree that technology is not uh, the problem. Um, but we uh, also need maybe stronger uh, stronger mechanisms to 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 phase out uh, the dirty technologies. Yeah? So um, um, a part of my research is about, um, um, for instance, the social norms. 
and also, um, for instance, advertisement bans, yeah, and maybe also bans on certain products uh, and services, yeah, that are the most uh, polluting, yeah. And and I think we have to open up, and and at least it's my experience that uh, uh, actually people think that bans are just, yeah. So so taxes are sometimes seen as uh, kind of. Uh, um, instruments that are not perceived as as just, but uh, but bans are kind of you now affecting everyone equally. So 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 they are seen more 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 as um, 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 as kind of justified uh, tools, yeah. And um, especially you now, like if you think about uh, smoking, yeah, like um, or alcohol or or, or um, um, drugs, yeah, like uh, these are kind of, these are products that cause uh, harm, you not know, to to humans. So they they are restricted, yeah, or, or there are some restriction, or like you cannot advertise them. Sometimes you cannot even buy them. Like if you talk about uh, drugs, yeah, um, and then you know if it comes to fossil fuels, it's it's, it's a yeah a damaging product. Yeah, it's a product that harms. Uh, uh, people now and will harm people in the future. So why not to uh, um, yeah to ban um, products that involve uh, burning uh, fossil fuels or at least you no know, start with advertisement bans. Uh, and 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 maybe the, the the final point is on on those uh, on the recent climate activists. So like uh, I don't know whether it's also the case uh, with you or, or some of our um, of um, of our audience. audience uh, 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 so, so I get like recently like about two uh, interview requests about the climate activists and the protests, yeah. And uh, journalists are asking, is this justified? Like, uh, how to interpret it? So I think we are maybe like we are like the whole no um, climate, um, uh, um, yeah, the, the the movement and 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 um, um, and, and actually the scope of of, of you no know, what kind of uh, tools and actions are available. Maybe this is changing, yeah, because you see more and more. Uh, kind of angry uh, kids on the streets, yeah, and and who kind of are starting to uh, to um, yeah um, damage also or, or or like to 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 know to to block roads and uh, damage p paintings and things like this, um, and uh, I, I think exactly it's a sign of impatience and uh, impatience and and we uh, there's maybe also a question how to know uh, how to exercise more pressure on decision makers that um, they prioritize uh, climate change. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, I, I finish with uh, with with, uh, with this example, and uh, yeah, looking forward to to questions and um, other comments. Thank you very much for also clarifying these issues of uh, uh, greenwashing, of uh, kind of facing out fossil fuels and other industries, of kind of toughening up, of maturing, of being clear of what is the enemy, of being clear of what is at stake of taking ownership, of taking the lead, of being proud of what we are doing as a movement. What I found very strong from what Nick was saying, you know, these angry nurses, the thousands of angry nurses who take the lead. Yeah, because when you see what is at stake and how we are behaving so far as uh, uh, humanity, it's appalling. So let's grow up, let's take the lead, let's be the ones who are rational, who are proud of what we are doing because there's no other way and then leading and being very clear in how we are identifying areas where we start and how we are speaking about the things that are not tolerable any longer. So we need how to tough up. Um, Tim, you were listening now, you were the first one presenting and now you were listening to Nick and Ilona, anything you want to add or, so, or that came to your mind? No, no, I want to salute Nick for the good work though. Um, absolutely. Nick, you want to add anything? I get caught all the time. I get caught all the time. My favorite, my favorite discussions at the pub are discussions about evolution and revolution, and they are discussions about um, uh, whether it is better for me to focus on my individual carbon footprint or my institution's carbon footprint, or whether it's better for me to, you know, go and attempt to storm number ten, go and go and protest outside. You know, I. My my the answer that I think I've arrived at there is a little boring. But I, I think it is that this is a big fight. It's not a one or two person fight. And I shouldn't put on myself the idea that I have to do absolutely all of that. Some of us are going to be producing the science and the evidence that is going to be compelling to Treasury to shift over some of their investment decisions. Some of us are going to be doing really, really boring 
you don't really want to be doing the job I'm doing, really boring sort of delivery stuff where I get to talk about LED lights all the time. All I talk about is LED lights um, uh, inside sort of shitty government buildings. Some of us get to do fun, exciting stuff about, you know, advocating, getting out in the streets, getting angry, shouting. Some of us get to go and look at what this means, you know, at an individual level on my ward or clinic. All, all of those actions are equally valid the thing that matters the most is that they are sort of true to you personally and they're frankly the thing not that is the biggest single biggest thing that any individual can do but that they are the action that i personally am going to do the thing that i will definitely do at 9 a.m tomorrow morning not the thing that i will talk about maybe doing one day if i get my act together nick i have one question i mean we have discussed that before but i think you have a large bet and the bet is when you are getting going, others will follow and compete with you and who is going to be first. So you're yeah. waiting for us in Germany, you're waiting for the guys in Australia, for the guys <laughs> in the US, in all countries to really take the leads themselves. So this is one of your bets because it's also clear from conversations we have had that moving the industry and moving the whole field will be much easier kind of if another two or three will join in and do it in very different contexts. Because the NHS is a unique context, so we need others. So my question is, is it one of the biggest bets that you started when you, when you started that others will follow and you will just go? You're not concerned that they will follow, but you have this bet within yourself that others will follow. So, so you're certainly right, right? Um, uh, we are, I started by saying the NHS is big. We are big. We're not that big. We are 2.6% of the global pharmaceutical market. The United States is 18.4%. Okay, so we are we we are absolutely big enough to challenge some of these giants of pharmaceuticals and med tech and medical devices, and absolutely we feel emboldened to. But can we do it alone? No, let's let's not pretend we can do it alone. The NHS cannot decarbonize without other healthcare systems around the world doing it at the same time. Frankly, because medicine is weird and complex, right? The full breadth of what it means to be a pharmacist or a nurse or a doctor—that full sort of amount of knowledge you have to teach isn't contained simply within the universities and the royal colleges in the United Kingdom. It's something that is shared. It's a global community. That's how medicine evolved. It's one of the better sort of network professions, I think, out there. And so the solution has to be properly networked as well. The, the thing, I, Martin, number one, I've, I, you're right. I have seen, as we've started to get quite serious about this, that shift, right? I have seen uh, other healthcare systems start to pay more attention. The thing that I had forgotten or got wrong. Uh, as I was thinking about coming to this job with the NHS, I was uh, thinking, well, listen, I used to do things with the Lancet Countdown, which is 100% of emissions, because that's tackling everything from coal-fired power plants to agricultural systems to you know absolutely everything. Why would I go to something that is only 5.4% of national emissions in one country? Tiny. What, what I think I'd forgotten is that nothing gets people excited like little victories. Nothing gets people excited, like feeling as though I've done this one thing. And do you know what? It was actually really positive. And I got some applause and I got some money that we saved for the trust. And then we did it again, but we did it twice and then 10 times and then 100 times. I, if I look at all of the examples of change within the NHS where we have really kicked ass, it's been because someone said, I'm just going to try it and I'm going to try it myself. And I'm going to shout about it. And, and a little bit, that's what's happening with the NHS here at the at the international level we're a slightly bigger than you know one person trying something on a ward example but we said we're actually quite serious and we are investing hundreds of millions of pounds into this and hiring 180 people nationally and many more across the country to do it and the french turned around and said oh shit okay and started to set up their own team of 70 or so people working on this and in the united states a new department of health equity and climate change within the Department of Health and Human Services, um, signing a procurement agreement with us only a week or two ago to align with our own procurement targets. And the same, I was down in Canberra in Australia, um, setting up a new federal unit there. I, what I'd forgotten was that when we demonstrate that this isn't just something that we can talk about, but it is deliverable and fun and exciting, people follow. Yeah. And it's actually picking up in Germany. We'll talk about that at another moment, but yeah. it, it really is picking, it's going to be picking up and we'll see a lot of changes uh, in the next months. Even on Monday, there's a big meeting with the German Hospital Association where Christian is facilitating big parts of it. So, so it's really, it's coming. And when we are coming in Germany, you know, we will, we are coming. Uh, but I think it's a very important uh, uh, 
aspect of social tipping dynamic, once you understand the possible non-linearity, when you get started, also you don't know where it will come, you go in a field and say, it will pick up, it will come, yeah? So it is this kind of uh, uh, movement of trust or of courage to just step out and say, things will emerge. When we started Kluge five years ago, we were just a handful of people. Yeah, but we said our task is to transform the, the German health sector, to make it aware of the planetary health emergency, to take responsibility and take a lead in the society. And all of that is happening now. I was speaking to three uh, uh, kind of chairs of, of large institutions today who are all now, now joining in, health insurers, uh, kind of the, the, the German Nursing Association and others who are really now picking it up jumping in and take making it their own thing. And now they are starting to set it on the agenda and it, it opens up new possibilities we couldn't see before. But I think it's a big thing. You go into a field which is blind, there is nothing. You just go in there and start and start with people and talk with people and things will follow and come. But it makes a huge difference knowing that these positive things can occur. Like you have it from your great, great aunt, Tim, and uh, uh, so it's really important to, to, to know these examples and see at the same time that we are still all, you know, Tim, Nick, Ilona, I, we are struggling with how to move things forward because we have our days where we look at things and we go, oh my God, it's not going fast enough. How can we bend the curve? Yeah. I think we're probably all realists, Martin. I mean, I, I'm an outside observer of the health sector, but there are gross kind of abuses of the public good, like the OxyContin scandal in the US. So it took an awful long time and the regulator had allowed the use of that medicine that um, took an awful long time to get a tipping point to shame that, that, that family as donors to major arts organizations and everybody else around the world and to expose that gross uh, indecency, shall we call it. Yeah. So yeah, we're all realists. But again, uh, the taking down of the injustices uh, can happen fast, thankfully. Uh, I think the COVAX initiative and its struggles is also a salutary tale. I mean, the global health community could have didn't exactly cover itself in glory, if I can be, if I can put it like that, in its uh, ability to coordinate um, in a global crisis, and that's because of very strong. Um, very, very strong, very rich um, companies, yep. pharmaceutical companies. Yep. Uh, so I look, uh, but in the space of public health service, we at least are a, a determined public good, and we and, and we as as the public can sort out the public goods. We'll get to the uh, private corporations through, hopefully, through uh, equally effective means. Yeah, Nick, you wanted to add something. I was waving at someone that was walking by. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I can take that. All right. Okay. No, so, Ilona, please. Yeah, yeah. No, I just think about uh, also not the breaking the power of. Um, so just as you have you no know, monopolies and no strong uh, big companies in the pharmaceutical industry, I mean the same like you in, in the fossil fuel industry. Yeah, these are like the, the biggest companies. Uh, and, and and they really um, are very, very powerful not the fossil fuel companies and 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 for me like what i understand something so some of those companies they belong to national states that actually signed the paris agreement yeah so in theory they should be controlled by the, by the state but but they i mean i, I don't know what's happening here like they uh, and and there are those massive amounts of subsidies that uh, still fossil fuel fuel industry is, is getting yeah so maybe it's also a question how to break uh, uh um yeah this uh, um this yeah um uh, in a way this 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 uh, yeah stability of, of the kind of, of the status quo yeah and and what needs to be done to uh, um to uh, you know for for new um or for renewable um um energy uh production to to kind of you know fully take off and uh, um yeah and um uh, yeah, how to break this, this rigidness of the system. Yeah, so it's maybe like a question that I'm asking uh, myself. And the fossil fuel companies like uh, still have they they have still plans on expanding um, their extraction uh, sites or their mining sites. Yeah, so uh, it's uh, an important question. 
And there's a question, how can we intervene? How can we read this field? How can we better understand how we can we build a heterogeneous alliance? Not an alliance with the ones we already know well, but a, a surprising alliance. How can we build one? How can we read? How can we see when the moments are to intervene so that we have the biggest chance to actually break a pattern that is destructive? The good news for Ilona and for everybody though, if you haven't heard it, is that um, new renewable energy installation in 2022 exceeded increasing demand for electricity. So it was actually displacing fossil fuels for the first time in history this year and is already the cheapest form of power in what we call a new for new comparison around pretty much the whole world and is only going to get cheaper through the coming uh, years the rest of this decade. So we're in the midst of renewable energy revolution, if, in case, even if we haven't noticed it. And that's going to be tremendous uh, and a great big positive tipping point. And that's just uh, thankful. Now we can be happy because that's in a place where uh, the, it, just the economics of it uh, increasingly makes sense. And the more you deploy, the cheaper it gets. And same for batteries. And, and then when you start electrifying everything, well, that's more efficient use of, of energy, basically, certainly for mobility and a number of other end uses like um, heating uh, through heat exchangers. So I think that's practical uh, and that's exciting. Uh, the harder challenges of come in other sectors that also link back to the health sector, of course, because your hospital's probably made out of some concrete and, and probably some steel as well. But we can see a way forward. We can see a future where green hydrogen is going to be cost competitive um, and that green hydrogen to reduce iron for steel production to have kind of zero emission steel can realistically come to a tipping point in a not too far future. Cement, I'm afraid, no, <laughs> cement is one of those things where to get rid of the carbon emissions, we're just going to have to pay the cost or we're going to be building high tech wooden hospitals and wooden buildings in the future. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Um, Friederike, uh, we are ready to take a few questions from the uh, audience, so please. Yes, uh, thanks a lot from my side and also from the side of the audience. Uh, we had more questions than almost ever. Uh, we are still trying to answer some of them and uh, include as many as possible now. So uh, many questions aimed at in this in a similar direction, and that was how does uh, your knowledge on social tipping dynamics influences your strategic advice? And now there were like different grades of um or forms of this question. So uh, in terms of uh, civil disobedience, is this a good idea? What do you think about last generation? You covered this a bit. Um, I mean, you also covered a bit on it's dependent, depending on your personal background, but maybe uh, having your, like your knowledge in mind, you could um, shortly, yeah, uh summarize your strategic conclusions looking at the climate justice movement and as a whole um or your your thoughts about this and i it's hard to direct the question so i would just give it um like a bit in the group and maybe you just jump in who wants to go first i can give it a go because i've been yeah. frantically trying to answer questions in the q a as well well we've got the others were chatting um in terms of how it informs strategic advice I would give. Um, some of that I've been lucky enough to be part of trying to give some useful advice through the through the policy process. So through when the UK's had presidency of COP26, which you just handed over at COP27, I tried to help inform the COP26 team put together something called the Breakthrough Agenda, which they launched at COP26, which has got major um, nations signing up to a positive tipping points agenda to design their energy policy and incentive schemes and the like. So that didn't get as much coverage in the media as perhaps it deserved, but it still exists and we still continue on an annual update of the breakthrough agenda to keep trying to give this type of nonlinear policy advice. Um, Back down to the level of the movement, my own students are often asking me, some of them, should I, you know, give up my PhD and go and march 
uh, you know, go and get arrested. I sort of say to them, you can do both. And they, <laughs> then, then they do, basically, <laughs> which is good with me. But at the same time, the front is broad and long and not everybody is going to want to get themselves arrested like my great aunt Lillian did. Um, and that's OK. Um, we don't all have to do everything. I think Nick was saying that eloquently earlier. We uh, we find out what what our particular capabilities are and we uh, we um, use those to the best of our ability. So that's my, my sort of strategic advice tends to involve trying to work out what kind of agency the person asking for the advice has. Uh, or the groups asking for the advice have, and then try to put that in a systems view, basically. Uh, yeah. Ilona. Yeah, maybe uh, to respond shortly, like uh, what what uh, we do uh, here uh, in, in Austria, uh, in Graz, is that, uh, first of all, there's a plan to make the university uh, climate neutral. It, it's not going very fast. And of course, there's also like lots of opposition, but yeah, we are working on this. So there's a plan to uh, introduce a carbon monitoring system at the university and then cut the emissions. And, and uh, just uh, now we uh, this, this semester, we, we launched like a new master program, climate change and transformation science. Yeah, so it's also an attempt to um, to provide the, um, the knowledge and the, the skills that uh, like future transition agents uh, need. Um, and you know that they feel comfortable with working with climate data and also social data. Um, and uh, at the end, we we, uh, we just wrote a, a big proposal on uh, um, supporting uh, the transition to to climate neutrality in Austria. So so um, uh, together with other researchers, like altogether forty other researchers, we uh, want to assist uh, the transition um, in in Austria. And we are now in the final competition um, stage. So uh, if we if we get there, then it really means like we can you know, build networks within um, the country and, and really you know, try to uh, um, you know, turn uh, or, or bring Austria uh, to, to, to climate neutrality by uh, 2040. I mean, I want to add, I think it's really important that we educate ourselves on these uh, nonlinear social dynamics. So just that we understand kind of the key parameters, what is in the literature and so on and so forth. Because it's very important to understand, you are all out there, you're change agents. So you are the center of the movement and neither Ilona nor Nick nor I can kind of advise you on what to do. We can give advice, we can share our examples, but I really trust that some of you will do things that no one of us could see. So it's important that we allow for this openness of the process. And the more you understand the dynamics and the more you can trust in the non-linearity uh, non also of our movement, you will identify things that we couldn't comprehend. It is important that we share with each other. And one of the things that I think is one of the most powerful uh, uh, kind of interventions is when you build this heterogeneous alliances with people you normally would not sit in the same meeting with, because their unprobability is kind of uh, doubled or, or quadrupled, and, uh, uh, and, and it gives us a big chance to do things you never could do. And you learn from people which you normally would not talk to, things you are not learning within your bubble. So it's really important to reach out to uh, kind of enemies to have fights, but also to reach out on a personal level. Because once people see that they are affected, their grandchildren are affected, they're not doing it because of their job, because they are human and they're still doing their job, but then they are committed to kind of uh, 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 do it in their own way and they will not go away. Once you have understood what is at stake, it doesn't leave you. So it's, it's important that we bet, kind of make bets like Nick has made but find your own way, find your own area where you're most passionate and, and reach out to others. And that's, that's the best advice I can give. And that's what I'm trying to do myself. Yes, maybe a question that's a bit uh, linked to this last advice um, that we need all different kinds of um, action uh, would be the questions. OK, I'm, I'm in change agent. I'm on my way. How do I know I'm following a path that is worth following? We Nick uh, or Timothy uh, partly answered this question in the chat, and I liked it because he clearly linked it like to the reduction of uh, CO2 emissions. But obviously, in some fields, it's harder to link or to have this direct link. And it's also 
might seem that it's really uh, a comparably a high effort to get this data if your action is doing it. So would you suggest we should still try to get this data or would, what would other indicators be that we are on track? Um, I, I realize I was suggesting that in the chat, but I think we don't have to get all the data. We, if we've done our homework, most of us already probably have a good sense of the emissions associated with long distance transport, flying, for example, the emissions associated with eating beef versus pigs versus chicken versus fish. Or if you haven't, it's really easy to find out. Um, so without going through all the numbers, um, for many activities, I would say it's quite easy to access information on, on the changing impacts they have on emissions. Um, so yeah, maybe don't no need to do fully quantitative, but um, it's good to have a sense of that if you're a scientifically minded person, and I'm assuming if you're medically trained, you are, because <laughs> the numbers count. But also qualitatively, I, I think, and I gave another answer to someone else in the chat, but uh, it just if you can map out that your particular action had reinforcing consequences, you know, there were closed causal feedback loops of consequences that, that amplified the desirable change you wanted, then that's a very, that's the central idea behind positive tipping or virtuous cycles. And I'm I'm confident you, we all can, I think, for some of the stuff we're talking about. And Nick, 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 Nick's given kind of his real, real examples of that, right? How, how one person or one group doing a rewarding activity within the NHS creates a momentum around it that then gets other people sucked into it, right? Classic reinforcing feedback. Ilona. Um, uh, so, so I fully agree, but you know, one more thing, like uh, like often you think that uh, yeah, scientists, researchers, they know everything, but it's it's we we don't know. Yes, so it's often kind of experimenting and trying out things, and also like uh, talking to uh, yeah, stakeholders and and people know on the ground and 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 kind of you know, kind of being open to uh, to this uh, experimentation and and uh, trying out and uh, yeah, also probably having fun is important. Yes, yeah, so uh, it's also my approach, kind of not trying out and uh, and then being open and learn you know, from you know, what is uh, happening. I mean, I'm partly disagreeing with Tim because uh, uh, I think on one level, we also need to follow certain intuitions or ideas where we don't have any indicators or measurement at the beginning at all. Uh, I want to point to what Nick was saying is that the biggest challenge I am creating there is really the social challenge. How do we get uh, people playing? How do we get them out of their paralysis? And sometimes you have a hunch, you have an idea that you could build a platform with some people, not clear yet what to do with them, but it might be a game changer later. So, and you just go for building the relationship and you don't know if it ever will turn out. But I just think if we are willing to also do things where we have no clue how to measure it, but just get going and get relating and be crazy a bit about it, then we will come to phases later where we can have some measurement. So I think it's really important to allow for the creativity and also sometimes the craziness of following through some of the ideas that do not make sense even scientifically, because uh, that's what I've learned in working with good scientists, sometimes the greatest invention come from this craziness and creativity that you just follow against all the advice you can get from someone else. So, and I, I, my sense is, uh, Nick, uh, uh, Tim, you're, you're with me on this. And on, on another level, we are probably not disagreeing. Yeah? But I, I really invite you to be crazy and be creative because we cannot do it with what is already known as methodologies. We need to also step out of it. And then we can use some of it, but we need to also in the way we relate and how we reach out and how we are having fun with each other. We need to be a bit crazy because we have to deal with a crazy challenge and we cannot do it just with uh, uh, analytical skills or the existing science, even the science, how we are doing it is too narrow. We need to kind of open it up and, and, and go. Yes, maybe. Uh, sorry, the same would also paralyze. Sometimes it's paralyzing research because you think like you need more data and more evidence, and and the time is running. Yes, yeah? so uh, fully agree. Yeah. So no, I, I do support you, Martin. I just know also the evidence that when 
people in general are surveyed about you give them 10 things and you ask them rank these actions in terms of the impact they'll have on climate change they generally get it completely the wrong way around yeah. so um it is useful to have some some real calibration or you can end up spending all your time throwing yourself at recycling which has got lots of other good reasons to do it but is absolutely tinsy effect on the climate and that miss that can get abused by those by nefarious forces as well and that's we all have to be switched on to that um that that misunderstanding and this feeling like oh yeah, yeah we're doing we're doing something good well which has peanuts impact you know Nick, you want to add? Bit of both. Right. Um, Maybe to the next one, sorry. Yeah, go on, go on. <laughs> go for it, Erica. Maybe you can include it in the next question because I think um, I think you have quite a lot to say about this. And uh, this would be about um, opposing powers and the interests or the the idea or the um, observation that um, emerged from this chat that social tipping can uh, go forward, but also backward, or in a direction that we wouldn't uh, consider desirable. So maybe uh, you could share some uh, thoughts on this to how to, yeah, uh, deal with opposing powers and also how to decide when to fight the um, opposing actions or when to actually ignore them or, um, yeah, and, and what the uh, social tipping dynamics uh, idea can teach us about this. Well, I can't tell you what social tipping dynamic can teach us about anything, but um, let me say that I probably avoid more fights than I suit up for. In fact, I only ever go into fight if I know I'm going to win, because I definitely don't want to waste my effort on a fight that I think I might lose just because it'll martyr myself and make myself feel good. If I see a battle that I'm worried about, about... Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, we were we were having a fight about uh, whether or not we would get crucified in the Daily Mail um, uh, if the NHS started to shift red meat consumption in our hospitals, the food that we were giving to our patients. The answer is yes. That would be a very, very dangerous thing for a thing as political as the NHS to do. Should we do it nonetheless? Yes, because it is good for our patients' health and because it's good for the farmers around us and frankly because it's good for the climate probably last out of those three reasons nonetheless politically would we have lost that fight absolutely so rather than fight that fight what we did instead was go and find five hospitals who were happy to just change their menus quietly and they didn't tell anyone about it and then they started surveying patients and then we started spreading that out across something called an integrated care system and then an entire region and we'd reduce red meat consumption by 48 percent without having that actual fight um so I think in the climate change and sustainability world, we do a really bad job of this. I think we like martyring ourselves and we like trying to fight the last fight because it makes us feel good because we're fighting something that's impossible. Um, I think we've got to get a lot smarter at framing ourselves as though we're on the winning team and being on the winning team, right? And demonstrating that we are the guys that you definitely don't want to go and mess with because we're the really professional, really sensible guys that are only going to argue for things that we know are uh, possible, positive, um, uh, sensible. So we spend a lot of our time doing that in the NHS, frankly, because we are worried. Either we're a bit of a political punching bag, if you're not careful, or we're quite worried about the negative tipping points that you're talking about as well. We're quite worried about the idea give you another example uh, that we have not fought at the moment because we did a little bit of research, realized we did not have the support of our patients and so backed off. Um, uh, nitrous gas, uh, analgesic gas, bit of a rubbish gas, frankly, it doesn't actually provide much analgesia. Huge amount of carbon though, about 1% we think of the entirety of the NHS's footprint. We can tackle piped surgical nitrous, fine. We can tackle uh, uh, nitrous required in our emergency services and our ambulance services, fine. Nitrous in labor wards gets yeah, pretty tricky. Um, and we don't have a number of particularly good alternatives there that our patients are on board with. And so we went out and we asked, and we ran a proper survey and studied this properly for about a year, realized we did not have the support and took five steps back and said, well, then we can't jump into this because we are going to get smacked in the face. And what we did instead 
was we are just launching a commission with the Royal College of Midwives, the Royal College of Nurses, and the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and five patient groups for them to look into over a longer period of time what the solutions there might be. Now, that means we go slower, but I worry that if we had run at this immediately before we had full support, we would have taken eight steps back. That's really, really interesting because it's exactly like the, the meaning of, of uh, social tipping intervention. Yeah, that's a small intervention with a big uh, kind of systemic uh, or system level effect. Yeah, so exactly. So I think it's, it's, it's really... Uh, uh, important what what you are saying, yeah, that you need to focus. Okay, where where to invest your uh, your energy or effort, and what's you not know, the small change that can have this this big effect, and also recognizing windows of opportunity. So so when it's the good time, yeah, and sometimes like keeping in mind that the change will will not occur immediately, but it might take uh, some time, yeah, sometimes even a few years. Um, so so yeah, thanks for sharing those examples. I think it's very, very important to getting better in reading and sensing a complex constellation. And sometimes waiting for the right moment is the most powerful action. So to be patient and patient and patient, and then see what you can do to perhaps in increase readiness. But then when the moment is there, really go in. So it's really, really important yeah. that we are getting better together in reading constellations, reading where are the other openings, where are things closed for the moment? When is it changing? So that's why we need these heterogeneous alliances because we can only do that together. And if, if we trust each other, we can read things in a way that no one else out there, outside uh, uh, can do. So, so it's, it's really, really important and be patient in between. Because in the wrong moment, you wear yourself out and you are, you are actually creating more negative immune reactions outside that are very difficult to overcome later. So really, really important to smarten up. It's okay to try, if you can try things at a small scale there and make mistakes, that's okay. That's called, that's learning by doing. And we're gonna, and that's, I think, I kind of think that's exactly what Nick was also describing with a lot of this NHS strategic interventions. Because yeah. none of us pretend we know the perfect solution to the say to this great sustainability challenge. We're all going to have to learn our way through this. Federica, one more. Yes, maybe. Um, I I mean I I feel there's a bit of a um, fiat going up between everything you do in your from your own perspective is good, but you should be really strategic and do it at the right time. So maybe when with your answer to the next question, you could. Um, uh, explain this a bit uh, more in concrete and add some examples. I think this would be really helpful. Uh, but let me ask the um, the maybe last question. I could ask many more if uh, you're still <laughs> there. Um, and this would be uh, in your work, which I really recommend to read to all the uh, audience. We will post the links in the chat uh, in a moment as well. Um, you refer to examples, but they are uh, examples like, um, or in the social movement, they are, the examples that often come up are like the suffragette movement or the women's uh, rights movement or like the tobacco control movement. So those are comparably uh, small movements in yeah in comparison to what we are up to and to the systemic change we change uh, we we want to uh, enhance. So maybe you could. Um, the question would be, what can we still learn, even though this uh, social change we have observed is so much smaller? And with the, I think what has become really clear that uh, in comparison with past transformations, the challenge right now is that we have a direction. We know that we need to reduce um, uh, CO2 and other resources. So it's not that we can uh, totally uh, develop in whatever, wherever it takes us, but we have this uh, quite clear um, task to manage. So. Yeah, this would be the combined last question. Or I can start, yeah, but well, so uh, uh, yeah, we um, we look at the historic uh, examples, but uh, of course, there's no perfect example because the scale of the challenge that we are facing it's just unprecedented. Yeah, it never, you know, something like this never happened. Yes, yeah? so. Um, in a way, we have to be open, but also look um, and yeah, learn and so on, but also look at those uh, historic cases and, and learn uh, what uh, worked or how this change happened. So also like this example that uh, Tim mentioned with of his uh, great, great aunt, yeah, like in that case, like what was successful, how, how do you know how this change occurred and like what is the constellation of uh, agent that is needed to, to tip the system, yeah, so 
Um, I think we can, despite maybe that those past cases were, were uh, not, you know, at the plantar scale, there's still uh, many useful lessons uh, to learn. But again, you know, the scale of that challenge is unprecedented. So, um, yeah, it's a big experiment. I, I touched on the example of uh, electric vehicles in Norway, not, not a perfect technology, but uh, the fact that roughly four people with a clear strategic plan uh, that brought the media with them in 1989, they started this movement. Ultimately, um, very, through, yeah, through a very clever um, thought out systems thinking strategic intervention ended up triggering that country to be the first in the world to transform personal mobility. And incidentally, they had a vision in 1989 for zero emissions buildings, passive houses, uh, solar revolution for Norway. Now that hasn't quite unfolded to the degree that the electric vehicle transformation has, but still the disproportionate impact from a well, a well thought through uh, intervention there is extraordinary. And that really has made, you know, you can scale, you can try and do some scaling between, you know, four people in a whole nation's mobility sectors emissions, which for a rich nation in Western or Northern Europe is about 15% typically of their greenhouse gas emissions. That's a pretty big um, bang for your buck. So there are real examples out there right now and stories waiting to be told of extraordinarily disproportionate impact of social actions in the broad sense on emissions that really count for the climate. And actually, I think probably some of Nick's and his predecessors work at the NHS um, would fit in that category. <laughs> so yeah, I, I feel like it's a, perhaps a collective duty to, to find and document those. Nick, you want to comment also? Sure, sure. I think Tim was referring to Sonia and um, and David, and absolutely right. Uh, uh, I get to do all the fun stuff because they did all the hard work for a couple of years, for 10 years before me. Um, uh, I think it's the only thing that matters. I think those sorts of changes are the only thing. When I genuinely, I'm not, I'm not sort of being facetious. When I look out across the NHS and say, where have we really, really reduced emissions? It is not, sure, sure, you know, uh, the 877 million pounds is a lot of money and and that's gone into some boring stuff like led lights and energy efficiency but the stuff that's really really counted was when an anesthetist about seven or eight years ago went and figured out the carbon footprint of desfluorane then they compared it to isofluorane then they compared it to sevafluorane then they compared it to tiva total intravenous therapy everyone said they were insane for talking about it then the companies tried to say no no, no you can't do that we'll come up with some other way they sat on their hands for 10 years then they said, I'm just going to start phasing it out. And everyone said, you can't do that. What are you talking about? They did it. They phased it out of their own operations. Then the operations of all of their colleagues in their hospital. Then they studied it properly, demonstrated it was damn safe, actually safer for patients, demonstrated it was cheaper, demonstrated it reduced the footprint of their anesthetic service by 96%. That's how big an impact Desflurane had as an anesthetic gas. One hospital in the country, that was two years ago. Now 49 hospitals in the country don't have any desflurane at all. The NHS hasn't announced this yet, but we think we are uh, half a heartbeat away. Um, we're actually kind of just looking for the right public forum to do it, but we're ready to announce that we don't need it at all. We're ready to announce that a high quality healthcare system doesn't need it at all. It didn't happen because of a bit of bureaucrat. It happened because someone 13 years ago went and footprinted desflurane. That's a pandemic, <laughs> infectious, because also in Germany, uh, hospitals start moving in the same direction. So uh, it's, it's getting, de developing examples like this, developing it in a small setting and then sharing it and then it goes viral uh, or can go viral. So we're getting to the end of today. Um, how was it for you guys to be part of this? Is it a useful setup of how we are doing this? And uh, I'm assuming you will be willing to come again later on when we are continuing this. But Tim, how was it for you? Oh yeah, great to join you and uh, great to see the kind of energy in this sector for change. Um, you're practical people um, and you have yeah, it's great to see your your drive your um, drive to 
create this kind of change. And you have all the right met metaphors at your disposal as, as the medically trained. And and I guess I, if I, if anything, I would encourage you to yeah both find and tell those stories of change that are already happening, but also put it in a kind of medical metaphor, because I think that will speak probably better to people than the kind of maybe even than the social tipping point type of abstraction that us uh, academics have come up with. Yeah. Ilona? Yes, so uh, I really appreciate this, uh, this format. So it's a bit different because usually like in, in my um, presentation, so I have like longer presentation time and then sort of, you know, you can go through your research step by step and explain uh, more. But I think it, it's really good because it kind of it gives us more time to um, to discuss and to also reflect on each other uh, opinions, so it's it, it's it's great. I was thinking maybe uh, like some of the questions are very practical, yes. So maybe there's we need some space where we kind of you know take more time and answer the, those kind of practical questions. How to change, for instance, the food at uh, canteens in hospitals, yeah. So so things like this, and uh, so, so maybe we need you know some extra I don't know chat time to 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 answer those kind of like more practical questions. But otherwise, uh, yeah, great experience. So thanks for uh, organizing this. Thank you, Nick. Martin, you know this. Yeah, this is my favorite thing to come to in the entire year. Um, I'm not. I'm not joking. And uh, why? Because it's every time that I get to show up and see, year by year, month by month, day by day, Klug and the healthcare profession in Germany moving from strength to strength. It is damn inspirational. It's nothing other than this stuff that gives me hope and gets me excited about the fact that we're going to turn this from something that is just possible, just positive into an inevitable transition for the future of healthcare. I'll come back anytime. We will ask you again. I, I really do think it's important to pick up on, on Tim's that we build these narratives, that we build these stories. At the same time, I think it's important important for the key change agents that they understand in depth the theory behind it. I, I'm a, a firm believer that if you do both, you get very strong. And if you better understand what you are doing, and if you are sharp, more sharp in our understanding of the background and why we are doing things, uh, things and what, when we have better exchange like we are having now, we are all learning. And we need that in addition to the practical examples to doing uh, 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 lectures and workshops on what we do in the in the uh, uh, in the food sector and and what what are we doing uh, with the anesthetists and with the pediatricians and with the nurses. So we need to, to to translate all of these ideas into the different fields. But at the same time, we need the spaces where we step back, where we reflect, where we understand better, to be empowered, and also understand how special it is what we are developing together on a global scale. So thank you very much for your contribution. We'll come back. We'll continue this conversation. We will have a next event in Germany, in Munich, on the 23rd of January, together with Harald Lesch and with uh, Claudia treidel hoffmann with the same title. But of course, the content will be very different because it will be different uh, players. Uh, and it will be a live event in Munich, and it will be streamed. So we are expecting up to 1,000 people live and many, many people also uh, coming for the stream and uh, also we will have in february the two uh, social tipping intervention labs which where we expecting people coming with concrete transformational projects that they want to work on with it, as they want to be more strategic they want to further develop it so uh, you find it on our website and i think friederike has put it there thank you very much to friederike and the team they have made this possible and thank you very much for you joining um, have a good evening and uh, I hope the Nikolaus is nice to use tonight that you have been nice last year so Nikolaus will give you lots of chocolate and not a beating thank you very much take care bye thank you